Joseph Fourier changed mathematics forever. He was the first person to really understand how heat works and he needed some radical maths to be able to deal with it. That's how Fourier series were first discovered. But this was still a long way away in 1795 when 27-year-old Fourier had spent the last month in prison. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You see, for the past few years, this mathematics teacher turned revolutionary had been involved in the Reign of Terror, a movement which had seen thousands sent to the guillotine. But as political tensions eased for a short while, Fourier got a second chance and for the next few years his life was pretty calm. He got back into teaching and it seems like Fourier was a great teacher. In two years he became chair of analysis and mechanics at the Ecole Polytechnique replacing the eminent Joseph Louis Lagrange. This ended abruptly in 1798 when a letter said his talents were needed for the sake of public service and he should prepare to leave immediately. This public service, it turns out, was the invasion of Egypt led by Napoleon Bonaparte. Here Fourier was put in charge of the Corriere de l'Egypte a newspaper basically promoting propaganda for Napoleon. He was also made secretary for the Institute of Egypt, which was founded by Napoleon to carry out scientific and historical research. It's said that at one point, Fourier was the unofficial governor of large parts of Egypt while Napoleon was away fighting. When he finally got back to France, about three years later, Fourier was given another powerful political position as prefect of his heir handed to him by Napoleon, but more importantly for us, this is where he started work on what would become some of the biggest ideas in mathematics history. In the early 1800s, heat was a mystery. What it was, and more crucially a mathematical description of how it works, was at the top of the agenda for all the top scientists and mathematicians. When Fourier turned his attention to the problem of heat, there were two well-established principles. First, there was Newton's law of cooling, where heat flux from an object is a constant, the heat transfer rate, times the surface area, times the difference in temperature. And secondly, pioneering experiments by Lavoisier and Laplace, in which they built the first calorimeters, showed that different materials had different capacities for heat storage. They worked out that an increment of heat, dq, it takes to raise the temperature of a mass m, by an increment dt is equal to a constant c called the specific heat capacity of the material times m. A material with a high specific heat capacity therefore takes more heat to raise its temperature. Since an object's mass is its density rho multiplied by its volume v, we can also write this as equal to c times rho times v, which will turn out to be more useful later. Fourier wanted to calculate the flow of heat through solid objects. You see, every point in space has its own temperature, so temperature is a function of space, but heat will flow from hotter regions to colder regions and so it changes over time. This means temperature is also a function of time. His brilliant insight was that if these two laws are true on the objects as a whole, it should also be true within small pieces of the object. So he could use Newton, Laplace and Lavoisier's laws to calculate heat flow within an object by breaking it up into infinitesimally small pieces. Take Newton's law for instance, which tells us how heat flows across a surface area. Well, if we imagine some tiny piece of surface area, ds, and suppose it's perpendicular to the x-axis and is at x equals a, heat flow through it, dq, is Newton's law with the area replaced by ds, and the temperature difference is the derivative of the temperature with respect to x evaluated at x equals a. This is now called Fourier's law. Now let's take a volume dv, which is a tiny cube of material with sides of length dx, and each face has an area ds. The heat flux into it per unit time will be the amount going in from one side, dq1 minus the amount leaving from the other side, dq2. 
although I should say that we're not actually making assumptions about which way heat is going. This is about the amount of flow in the x direction. dq1 and dq2 can be positive or negative. Fourier's law applied to this volume gives us heat flux in and out, but we can make things easier with some work on this dt by dx at a plus dx term. Rather than dt by dx at a plus dx, we want something involving dt by dx at x equals a. Since dx is small, we can assume that dt by dx is approximately a straight line over this range. We know that the dt by dx term at x equals a plus dx will be whatever it was at x equals a, plus however much it's increased over the range dx, which we'll call dt. From basic calculus, we can get dt as the second derivative of t with respect to x, evaluated at a, multiplied by dx. So finally, we have dt by dx at x equals a plus dx is the derivative of t at a plus the second derivative of t at a multiplied by dx. If you know Taylor series, you might recognize this as the first order Taylor expansion. This is an important step because if we put that back into the equation for dq, we find that the dt by dx terms cancel. And so we're left with k times d squared t by dx squared times ds times dx times dt. This is where the specific heat capacity comes in. One thing to notice is that we have ds dx on the left hand side and dv on the right. But these are the same thing and so they also cancel. If we divide both sides by dt, we're left with d temperature by dt is a constant alpha, and I've simplified things by combining the previous constants, times the second derivative of temperature with respect to x. This is now what we call the heat equation. Actually, this is the one dimensional heat equation because we're only considering heat along the x axis. But if we want to add extra dimensions, all we need to do is add the second derivative terms for each axis because we can think of heat flow happening independently in x, y, and z. What it does is, given the current temperature as a function of x, it says where the second derivative, that's the curvature is negative, temperature will decrease as heat flows away from this region. And where the second derivative is positive, so the function is curving upwards, the temperature will increase as heat flows in. This makes intuitive sense because the negatively curved regions represent local hot spots and positively curved regions represent local cold spots. This was a huge breakthrough for Fourier. Not only is it still the best model of heat we have today, but it's also been applied in many other scenarios including the diffusion of molecules in liquids and the movement of stock market prices. But the problem was, now that Fourier had discovered the heat equation, how do you actually solve it? Solving the heat equation means finding a function t of the spatial variables x, y, and z if we're working in 3D, and time t that you can plug into both sides and the equality holds. But this is a partial differential equation, meaning it has derivatives in more than one variable, and these are notoriously hard to solve. Laplace had been studying a simpler partial differential equation and had found a solution that was useful to Fourier. For some function u, we have the sum of its second derivatives is equal to zero. You might notice that it's like the heat equation, but it's got no time component. Some of you who have studied vector calculus might also know there's a shorthand for this equation. The Laplacian of u equals zero. Trying to solve the two dimensional version, Laplace found a useful approach was to look for solutions of the form of some function f of x only times some function g of y only. For example, if we have u of x and y is equal to e to the minus kx times cosine of ky, we can plug this into Laplace's equation and show that it is a solution. 
Laplace also found that if you have more than one solution, you can combine them in a series with arbitrary constants that I've written here as A, B, and C, etc. This is called a linear combination of solutions. So, for example, taking the earlier general solution, we can form a new one by taking a linear combination of a set of them with different coefficients k1, k2, k3, etc. Now, back to Fourier. He realized that Laplace's equation was useful for the 2D heat equation. He imagined a metal sheet which was infinitely long in the x direction and went from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2 in the y direction. It sounds very arbitrary, but he did have a good reason. If we imagine fixing the temperature 1 at x equals 0, like it's being heated at this end, and on the other edges, y equals plus or minus pi over 2, the temperature is fixed at 0. These are the boundary conditions. Now, the sheet would heat up for a period of time and then settle at a steady state. That is, the temperature would stop changing. What Fourier realized is that in the steady state, the temperature stops changing with time. The derivative of the temperature with respect to time goes to zero and the heat equation becomes Laplace's equation. That means we already have a solution for the steady state. We can use Laplace's general solution. This is why Fourier made the sheet with these particular dimensions. He thought he might be able to find the right values for the coefficients to make the solution fit the boundary conditions. Firstly, since cosine of y is 0 only when y is an odd number multiplied by plus or minus pi over 2, we can say that the values k1, k2, etc. are just the odd numbers. This gives us the right values along the t equals 0 edges, but we need to make sure that t is always equal to 1 when x is 0. At x equals 0, all the exponential components become 1, which means Fourier was left with finding the coefficients such that this infinite series is equal to 1. Remember that y varies between minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, so this is the same of finding an infinite series of cosines such that they always add up to 1. But how do you go about finding these coefficients? Fourier's approach was genius, realizing that integrating cosine of mx times cosine of nx is 0 if m is not equal to n, and pi over 2 if n equals n. If you want to have a go about proving this, try using the product identity for cosines. This gave Fourier a way to calculate any coefficient he wanted. Suppose you want to calculate c, the coefficient of cosine of 5y. You can multiply both sides by cosine 5y and integrate from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. Using the laws of integration, we can distribute the integral. Now, all of the integrals with different cosines we know will be 0. This leaves only the one we're interested in, and we know the right hand side integral is pi over 2 from our product rule already. The left hand integral we can work out to give 2 over 5, and this means that c is equal to 4 over 5 pi. Working out the other coefficients gives an expression for 1 in the form of an infinite trigonometric series. Now, Fourier knew this idea went way beyond just solving the heat equation. In fact, when he published his book, The Analytical Theory of Heat, in 1822, Fourier dedicated large sections just to the study of these trigonometric series. What he recognized was the generality of the method. He said, using this approach, we can find a trigonometric series expansion for all possible functions, including discontinuous ones. And he gives us the method of finding the coefficients. This method is of course what we now know as Fourier series. That is, given a function defined on some range, usually minus pi to plus pi, any range is acceptable, but there has to be some scaling, we can write f of x as a series of sines and cosines, with the coefficients a sub n equal to 1 over pi times the integral of f of x times cosine of nx, 
and b sub n as 1 over pi times the integral of f of x times sine nx. If you want to explore more applications of Fourier series, including how to use the Fourier transform to solve the wave equation, then check out Brilliant.org, who have kindly sponsored this video. With Brilliant, you get access to thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and artificial intelligence. Each course is broken up into lessons you can do in just a few minutes, so it's really easy to do just little bits every day. Especially if, like me, you want to learn new things, but struggle to find the time to study. I've been using Brilliant to brush up on my probability skills, and I love how intuitive they make everything feel. Everything's really hands-on and based on real-life scenarios. It really does make learning easier, and for me, regardless of what I've done that day, doing a little bit of studying leaves me feeling like I've done something productive. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash drwillwood or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.